Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Collecting Continuums, What Now? An online presentation and conversation that addresses the significance of collecting at this unprecedented moment and includes contemporary perspectives from the Huntington Library, Greater Los Angeles, and beyond. Um, my, um, I'm here at the Huntington. This is not wallpaper behind me. Um, our library um, is closed to the public, uh, but our gardens are open. And um, we look forward to being able to share um, our collections with you again as soon as LA County permits, although we are increasing um, the number of materials that are available through our Huntington Digital Library as a substitute. Um, many of you watching are members and visitors who know us well. Um, and we're also grateful today um, to the Library Foundation of Los Angeles and the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America for their participation and co-sponsorship. And we extend um, a warm welcome to their audiences. 101 years ago, uh, Henry E. Huntington a New Yorker by birth, did something that was then considered to be totally outrageous. He moved his stellar library of rare books and manuscripts to Southern California. He saw the promise of Los Angeles, and indeed it is fair to say that with his Pacific Electric Railway and Huntington Land and Improvement Companies, he helped create modern LA. Since 1919, Los Angeles County has grown from a population of 900,000 to 10 million, and the Huntington Library now numbers 11 million items dating from the 11th century to the present. So tonight, it's also a special pleasure for us to bring Mr. Huntington's library back to NYC, so to speak, as this presentation is also a part of the first ever virtual edition of Bibliography Week, which usually happens each year in person uh, at the end of January, when the principal national organizations devoted to book history have their annual meetings in New York City. Through the power of Zoom, we can join in the programming and we send our greetings to bibliography viewers and our thanks to Eric Holzenberg for putting us on the program. This evening, I'm pleased um, to be joined by my colleague, Erin Chase, Assistant Curator of Architecture and Photography at the Huntington, who will serve as co-moderator for this event. Our panelists include Miroslava Chavez Garcia, Professor of History at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Brad Johnson, the current president of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America. Nancy Rosen, collector par excellence and president emerita of the Ephemera Society of America. And Todd LaRue, special projects director at the Library Foundation of Los Angeles as well as my Huntington colleagues, Li Wei Yang and Joel Klein, who hold the most recently created curatorships here in Pacific Rim Collections and History of Medicine, respectively. I'll be speaking for a bit, and then Erin's um, going to be exploring the roles of our participants in collecting and collections. And then there should be 15 minutes for discussion among the group and then 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, a little background. This is a Huntington program that was conceived as a live event before the pandemic in conjunction with the two-part library exhibition, What Now? Collecting for the Library in the 21st Century, which was mounted for the library's centennial celebration. The words, what now? have never been more relevant. And so they form the subtitle for our exploration of collecting continuums. At this moment now, 
collecting and collections have a heightened importance in society for our collective memory, culture, and history. This evening, we'll be looking at haunting and difficult items, as well as ones that produce joy. Uh, the Huntington has 11 million books, manuscripts, photographs, prints, ephemera, and audiovisual materials. Um, some 2 million of them acquired in the last century. Um, I'm rather in, the, in, in just this uh, 21st century. Um, so it was a bold move to think that our curators could select some 120 items uh, to represent recent trends in developing the library's 14 intersecting collection strengths. Um, the materials that were on view were truly curator's choices and the commonalities in the wide array of items on view naturally suggested to us the themes into which what now was organized. These in turn logically matched up to form four pairs, love and conflict, numbers and secrets, materiality and process, landscape and migrations. Objects from different locations and times were placed in conversation within and across these broad and relevant themes. Love features some of Nancy's Valentines, which we'll hear about in a bit, um, as well as a love letter from Guglielmo Marconi to a woman he met shipboard, partially written in Morse code. And the sheet music for the first hit song by an African-American girl group, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow, as well as a splendid hand illuminated edition of the Song of Solomon from 1902. In Materiality, an interactive atlas of the female body, edited by one of the first female graduates of Cornell Medical School, sits side by side with 19th century product packaging from our JT Last collection and a tile from the El Capitan Theater um, in Los Angeles. Um, and to the side of those um, is an early printed book uh, in its original binding signed by the artisan who fashioned it. We continue to add materials to the collections from the 15th century to the present. The uh, collecting continuum in English literature stems from a Middle English manuscript, The Legendary Travels of John Manville, to the Octavia E. Butler archive before our closure for COVID-19, our second most heavily consulted archive annually. But as broad as our range is at the Huntington, no one collector, private or institutional, can do it all. Those of us involved in collecting are all in continuums, within and across libraries and archives, with the trade and creators and custodians of documentary heritage. Alas, the second part of What Now was never installed last spring, and we hope that it will be up for a viewing as soon as LA County guidelines permit. We're also working to mount an online version of both parts. Um, one of the items in part two is the signature image for our event. And I'm going to turn over now to my good colleague, Erin, who will let you know more about it and why we think it's an appropriate image for this event and at this time. Um, and she'll begin our initial conversations with our panelists. So thank you, Erin. Thank you, Claudia. That was a, a wonderful introduction to a great event, which I'm delighted to be co-moderating with you. Um, I wanted to say a few words about this piece, which was scheduled to be included in the landscape section of part two of our exhibition, What Now? The painting was created in 1974 by Western artist Susan Hertel for the Miller Cheats Studio. And for the exhibition, we gave it the rubric Nature's Healing Power. The fantastical scene of woodland animals, which is so joyful to look at within nature's bounty and the children picking fruit or collecting it, was certainly meant to express visions of health and vitality and offer a semblance a semblance of hope and joy to those entering or leaving this hospital in Ventura for which it was created. 
In the words of the artist, my ideal in painting is that moment when what's every day is seen as magical. To me, that's what a painting can do. It can take that magical complexity and lead it into an inevitable, unquestionable simplicity and array the spirit. So in a year that's been remarkably difficult on so many levels, we thought it appropriate to bring nature's healing power to you all. And again, we wanna take the opportunity to thank you for being with us today. So now I'd like to introduce you to our panelists, starting with our first of five. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Brad Johnson. Brad Johnson has been active in the antiquarian book trade for more than 25 years. Initially as an, an apprentice to the late Roger Gazdecki at the bookshop in Covina, California. And now with his wife, Jen, as owner of Johnson Rare Books and Archives. His areas of specialty include literature and poetry, California in the West, archives and ephemera, and heavy metal music. Elected president of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America in 2019, he launched the association's diversity initiative in March, 2020, and is part of the team responsible for the successful virtual book fair program. So Brad, how do you see your role in collecting and how have you seen it change over your many years in the trade? Well, thank you, Erin, and uh, thank you, Claudia, and your entire team at the Huntington for putting together this really fantastic panel. Um, really pleased to take part and honored and more than a little bit humbled to be part of such an impressive group. Um, uh, as uh, Aaron alluded, I've been uh, since the age of 15 involved in the antiquarian book trade, and I'm here today to represent the bookseller's role in the collector collecting continuum. Uh, in a sense, booksellers are the farmers, foragers, and the farm to table restaurant all in one. Uh, basically, we help build the collections, public, private, and institutional. We are preserving the stories that provide context to our collective past. Some of these stories are well known, though increasingly, especially as we reckon with racial injustice, gender inequality, and other forms of discrimination, there's been a focus on what has been neglected, overlooked, and yet as yet unexplored. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the process of sourcing this material is intensive, and for our part at Johnson Rare Books and Archives, we have developed an extensive network of scouts, pickers, estate attorneys, realtors, librarians, auctioneers, colleagues, and clients. Uh, already in 2021, our team have evaluated for purchase more than 100,000 books, posters, photographs, and items of ephemera. Uh, this uh, image was taken uh, in the summer of 2019, back before it was cool to wear masks. Um, it's not always this rough and tumble, but uh, there, there's a certain charm to it. Uh, it. But it can be quite civilized otherwise, tidy shelves and organized file cabinets, air conditioning even. Um, but then again, it could also be something akin to archaeology or, or even speleology. And on several occasions, we find ourselves swatting away the silverfish in a dusty garage or as you see here, trying to maintain solid footing in a roll-off dumpster. But I mean, you only have one shot to save this material. Uh, we work very closely with a number of clients to meet their needs. We are their eyes and ears. And many of our best finds never hit the open market. All material that we bring in is fully cataloged and to the best of our ability placed in cultural context. We strive to keep collections together and place material with the institution where it's likely to receive the most academic attention. Uh, this photograph was taken uh, at the airport in New Orleans. I'm about uh, ready to get on uh, a plane there with my carry-on item, a late 19th century funeral home ledger, so, which uh, made for a, a kind of amusing game of uh, show and tell with my fellow passengers at 30,000 feet. Um, on occasion, we also build what we call seed collections, uh, material that is not represented in, special collection, in the special collections universe. For instance, in 2015, I built a collection on the history of heavy metal, metal mu music, uh, validating my teenage years in the process, which is now at UCLA. Um, my partner, Jen, has done similar work with California die cut advertising and board games with social commentary. Uh, every bookseller takes a slightly different approach to the trade. Um, in addition to the work I've already described, we work directly with established and new customers. We maintain an open shop here in Southern California. And though it's been closed uh, since March 13th because of COVID, 
Uh, we are in 2021 selling, uh, celebrating 40 years of uh, serving the bibliophiles of, bibliophiles of Southern California and beyond. Uh, we also sell books online through the ABAA.org and other venues and exhibit at book fairs in the US and abroad. Uh, while the pandemic, uh, with the pandemic rather, many former in-person events are now virtual like this one, uh, including the Bibliography Week Showcase, which happens in conjunction with um, Bib Week there in New York. We've taken it online this year, as you can see here. And uh, if you haven't already, I really encourage everyone to visit the showcase at aba.org slash VBF. Uh, the fair is open until 4 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow on Thursday. Uh, I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say that I'm really looking forward to the return of in-person book fairs and other sort of such things and all those dinners that happen afterwards. However, these virtual fairs have been really successful in bringing in new and interesting material to market, supporting small businesses like ours that are struggling in this economy and collecting and connecting collectors with booksellers like me, as well as librarians and archivists. Um, it's a reminder of how engaged and supportive the greater rare book community is. And as I always recommend to those who attend my Rare Books 101 panels, I really encourage all collectors, public, private, and institutional, to identify and work with booksellers or a group of booksellers you trust, um, especially members of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America, who are fully vetted, abide by a very strict code of ethics, and represent the highest standards in the trade. We will be your agents and your advocates. So uh, deputize, uh, deputize us, give us our marching orders, and you'll be surprised what we turn up. So uh, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Brad, for a great introduction to the trade and what you're doing. And we'll talk probably in our discussion later a little bit more about the mentorship program that you've just created at ABAA. Um, looking for for materials that have been overlooked. Um, we're, I'm now going to turn over to Erin, who's going to give an introduction to Li Wei Yang, who um, is um, pioneering a new area for the Huntington. Yes, I am delighted to introduce my colleague, Li Wei Yang, who's been curator of Pacific Rim collections at the Huntington since the position was created in 2015, the same year that he curated the Huntington's first exhibition on Chinese American history. YC Hong, advocate for Chinese American inclusion. Prior to 2015, Li Wei held the positions of institutional archivist and project archivist at the Huntington. He received his Master of Science in History from the University of Edinburgh and his MLIS from San Jose State University and served as a board member for the Society of California Archivists from 2015 to 2017. Li Wei's next exhibition, printed in 1085, will focus on the Huntington's oldest printed book, a Chinese Buddhist canon. So Li Wei, can you tell us about your role collecting for the Huntington in this new curatorial area and particularly the community focus of your work? Thank you, Erin, for the kind introduction. And so the exhibition, what now, is showcasing a number of wonderful items that I have been focusing on heavily since my position was created back in 2015. And these items represent subject areas in Asian American history, in immigration history, history of Hawaii, just to name a few. So my role in collecting in collection is quite straightforward. First is to keep up with historical trend, to know what historians are writing and try to predict what they want to write next. And the next is to seek out those underrepresented voices in history and bring some diversities to our collections. And three is to communicate with those individuals and communities uh, in regard to their preservation needs. The Huntington is strategically located here in the Los Angeles area. It's a major receiving point of immigrants uh, throughout its recorded history. However, the history of these immigrants were not always known or preserved. Therefore, I think it is important for me to let the community know uh, about the Huntington's mission and to extend the Huntington's preservation resources to them should they uh, want to partner with us. I want to also want to make sure that we can capture as much as possible the history of people, of culture, and societies across the Pacific Rim. Another point I want to make is the, the, the is strive, strive, striving for diversity in library collections. Historically, Los Angeles has gone through waves of demographic change, whether it is the 1840s, 1965, or even today. 
uh, we as an institution have an obligation to reflect the community that we live in because archive shouldn't just reflect a particular group or a class or gender. And this is where collecting comes in to play a role. We as curators must collect from a wide range of people and communities and strive for diversity in collections, whether they are the transnational lives of, um, of Japanese American farmers in the 1930s, or we're talking about the immigration documents of Chinese immigrants during the Chinese exclusion era, or manuscripts documenting American diplomatic and military activities in the Pacific in the 19th century. I think we can all agree that having a diverse collections are the best gift we can pass on to future generations. And so I wanted to start off in showing you a few items from the Pacific Rim collections. So we are now showing you a panor panoramic photographs uh, from the author Ito collections. And this photographs is depicting the Kuromi families in a flower field in Hollywood in 1928. So early 20th century, many Japanese Americans here in Los Angeles were engaged in the agricultural trade. And this particular, this family in particular was in the agricultural field. Uh, this collection is from the author Ito Papers, who later became a very famous uh, hybridizer of flowers and flower sellers here in Los Angeles. What's special about this collection is that it is it has many transnational aspects to it. So author Ito was, was born here in the United States, here in Los Angeles, but uh, he, at an early age, his family, his, uh, his families decided that they were moved to Mexico uh, because of the the prohibition against uh, Japanese from owning land here in California. And so, so, so author spent many early years of his life in, in, in Mexico and then actually uh, wrote down his experience in a diary that he kept. And this is the only collection that I'm aware of when it comes to recording the Japanese experience in Mexico in the first hand diary form. So this is a very valuable collection. And this particular photographs, the Kolomi family was the family that he later married into. Um, and together they created one of the most famous uh, flower uh, growing company, one of the most uh, famous florists uh, here in Los Angeles area. And, and eventually the flower stand became very famous uh, to, to Hollywood types in this area as well too. Next slides, please. And the next uh, item that I want to show you is a certificate of identity. And, and so this ordinary looking identity card was actually created uh, to track Chinese Americans here in the United States during the Chinese exclusion era. No other uh, uh, ethnic or, or racial groups were required to carry this kind of uh, form of identification. Uh, this was uh, created during the exclusion era because the government wanted to keep track. Uh, in addition to barring the Chinese from coming into the United States, they wanted to make sure that they can keep track of the, the existing Chinese population here in the United States. And the certificate identity eventually evolved to become the current system for the green card. Next slides. The next item that I wanted to show you is a Japanese map of Hawaii. And this particular map was created in 1906 in order to entice more immigrants to come to Hawaii. And so it was sold very cheaply and it, and it contains all the basic information about Hawaii. Uh, it also has a lot of advertisements of Japanese owned businesses uh, in Hawaii in order to attract uh, more uh, Japanese immigrants to the islands and also to um, uh, familiarize uh, the, the, the Hawaiian settings uh, to incoming immigrants uh, coming into the, the islands as well too. Next slides. And I just wanted to, uh, this last item I wanted to show is that by working with book dealers such as this one, and this is a Japanese uh, manuscript scrolls, um, Commodore Perry's incursion into Japan in 1853. So I was working with a dealer based on the East Coast uh, of uh, on working to purchase this uh, very expensive uh, Japanese scrolls uh, documenting uh, P Commodore Perry's incursion into Japan. And this particular scroll came into us through the Collector's Council, a, a, a annual events here at the Huntington, where the Huntington's most generous donors would decide on purchasing materials for the Huntington's collections. And this particular scroll, when it fully opens up, is about 22 feet long, and it contains a wealth of information on the drawings and, and textual information uh, that was documented by Japanese artisans uh, when Perry first made his incursions into Japan in 1853. Thank you. Thank you so much, Li Wei, and um, you naturally um, lead into um, our next speaker, Miroslava, because um, both um, 
leeway and our Hispanic, um, our curator of Hispanic collections, uh, Clay, have been involved in migrant letters, um, collecting migrant letters. That's a very important area now for the Huntington. So Erin, um, without further ado. Yeah, so next I am very happy to introduce Miroslava Chavez Garcia. She's professor of history at the University of, Uni of California, Santa Barbara, where she also holds affiliations in the Department of Chicana, Chicano Studies and Feminist Studies. Her books include Negotiating Conquest, Gender and Power in California, 1770s to 1880s, and States of Delinquency, Race and Science in the Making of California's Juvenile Justice System. And most recently, Migrant Longing, Letter Writing Across the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands, a history of migration, courtship, and identity as told through more than 300 personal letters exchanged across the U.S.-Mexico borderlands among family members and friends. In 2020, the book was selected as a 2019 Choice Outstanding Acad Academic Title, and in 2019, it won the Western Association of Women's Historians Barbara Penny Canner Award to honor the book that illustrates the use of a specific set of primary sources, such as diaries, letters, and interviews. Throughout her scholarly career, she has been an avid researcher in archives and libraries, including the Huntington, where her family's papers now reside. So Miros, you have used and recognized the power of collections for your historical writing, and you also have a very personal story about your family's papers that we would love for you to share with us. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me today and for including my family collection the, um, that I donated to the Huntington in uh, today's event. It means um, a lot. So, so yeah, I'm very excited to be able to share um, some snippets from my family history here from the family collection. Um, certainly, I think what's been really um, engaging and fun in this whole process is the fact that on the one hand, I am a historian, I'm a scholar, so I do this research. On the other hand, I see myself sort of as this ordinary person who happens to have an extraordinary collection. Um, uh, this collection of family letters, which are over 300 uh, family letters uh, that were written uh, among family members, um, my parents, um, their, their siblings, um, my grandfather, across the US-Mexico border with some people in the United States, primarily in Southern California, and another group based in Mexico, in Central Mexico, in Aguascalientes. Um, so I see, some, some, I see myself as somebody very fortunate to have this collection um, that in many ways is very important because I think what they allow people to do is to provide this sort of an insight into this, the personal, the emotional, intimate world of migrants. Not only just my family members, but we get to see these migrants navigating the social and political developments in the United States and Mexico. So it's quite fascinating to use these letters both as um, to see them as, as um, representations of, of love that was exchanged among my family, but also to see as, as these sort of mini windows or in these larger windows enter these larger developments happening. Um, I think in looking at the personal and intimate aspects of the letters, they're able to tell us about the kinds of things that um, were going through, their, um, going through their minds and through their hearts. So in the letters, they write a lot about missing home, about um, being down on their luck, about the anticipation and the joy of their next trip home. And then in turn, if we read the letters from people writing from Mexico to the people in um, California, you hear a lot about, uh, about the expectations that they have about their friends and family members in the North, right? In the Norte, as we say, um, being based in Mexico, these authors write about um, waiting for money, right? For the remittances, waiting for them to come home and waiting to hear about many times the, even the sexual exploits that they engaged in um, while they were uh, abroad, right? So these are the kinds of stories that you hear. Um, and so it was really, for me, having coming into this collection that I was fortunate enough from family members who collected these, who kept them, um, to be able to piece together what was going on in my family and then link it and place it into this broader network, this broader context that's happening. And I wanna just share with you a couple of images of letters. So here's the first letter. Um, so a subset of this 300 letters are letters that my parents wrote to each other, courtship. This is the first letter that my father wrote to my mother in 1963. And they have a, a, a collection of about 80 letters between them. And this letter, what I like to use it in two different ways. Um, my, the collection of letters I use in multiple ways, but um, I look at sort of the literary analysis, uh, sort of a literary analysis, the literary qualities of it to see. Uh, and so I use the letters as cultural texts to look at um, how they wrote 
what they said, what they wanted to portray, um, you know, what kinds of identities they constructed, you know, what was most at play in these letters. So you get to see the highly stylized letter writing of my, of my father, who actually only had a sixth grade education and which was the highest level of education in his family. So um, that was a lot of fun for me to go through that and to see what he was constructing of the narr narrating the self and constructing the self through these letters and being very deliberate about that. Um, and we can go on to the next letter. And in response, so then my mother who was, um, there was a quite a bit of age difference. So my father was 30 years old, Mexican man living in the Imperial Valley looking for a wife. My mother was 18. She was not interested in getting married but she was interested in the attention. And so in her letters, we see her, um, you know, paying attention to what he's saying. She's conscious of what he's writing and how he's writing it. In this letter in particular, she's saying like, you know, it might seem strange to you that I'm writing to you on a letter without lines and unlined paper, but I see you were doing it and I was becoming jealous of your ability to do that, but I'm doing a horrible job. Look at my letters are going kind of everywhere up in the air and so forth. And so you see this back and forth in play. Um, and luckily we have those two sets of letters. And I think that that's what makes this um, collection quite, um, uh, I think unique in some ways, at least lots of um, archivists have told me that it's quite unusual to have a back and forth. Um, so these letters are important to me, as I said, not only because it is a part of my family history, it allows me to tell these stories about migration, the personal, emotional and intimate stories that we don't always hear about, right? We hear about the economic reasons that people travel, but this is sort of, it gets at a different level of the migrant experience. But also what's important to me, um, I do Mexican American history, Chicana Chicano history, Latina Latino history. And so this is sort of one of many, I would say hundreds of collections of thousands of pages of documents and materials that are available for this kind of history. So I'd like to move on to the next slide, please. And so this is another sample of records that I've used in my research. And this is a criminal court case that comes from a collection held at the Seaver Center for Western History at the LA County Museum of Natural History. And this is um, a court case from 1841 in Mexican Los Angeles, it happens to be um, a German foreigner who was living in LA. Uh, he owned a shop, he was murdered. And so they investigate the murder. It's about 300 to 400 pages long. And this is the cover page and it tells you sort of the opening. Uh, we go to the next page, please. And the next page, sort of the formality, the opening of the case, sort of telling you the judge and it sort of the, gives you this insight into the, the criminal justice system and how it operated in Los Angeles. So in the one hand, this document is really useful for that to telling you what kinds of structures and people and officials that were involved. Uh, and the next image, please. And another wonderful aspect of this collection, which is um, a nine volume collection of handwritten original Spanish language documents, is that in this particular collection, you see a lot of inventories recorded of what was in his store of this um, uh, store, uh, the shopkeeper who was killed. And you see the things that he had. And so that, that says a lot about the material culture in the community. And that's something that I have not yet quite mined in the way I would like to do. So that's another one of my projects I would, I still don't want to let go, but he talks about, um, uh, you know, having silk and having thread and having, um, selling uh, agujas, which are, you know, needles. So all of these things give you these bird's eye view of what was going on the committee, but in a community, but if you, you know, situate these in this context, broader context, you're able to bring to life what people were doing and how they were doing these things. So there's many ways to get at this um, histories as um, my previous colleague was talking about. So. Thank you again for allowing me to share some of these documents and I look forward to hearing more from my other colleagues. Thanks. Thank you, Miros. Um, you know, the Huntington is one of a number of really great resources for the study of Mexican California, also Spanish California here. Mr. Huntington um, really was in interested in that material. It's not a recent collecting area for us. We have a lot of 19th century um, material. Um, so now I think we're going um, to, speaking of the, the legacy of our early collecting, we're going to head over to Joel's area, which is history of medicine. So I am delighted to introduce another one of my esteemed colleagues here, Joel Klein. He came to the Huntington in 2018 as the first Molina curator of the history of medicine and allied sciences, stewarding, stewarding the history of medicine and pre-1800 science collections. He received his PhD in the history and 
and Philosophy of Science at Indiana University and held postdoctoral positions at the Science History Institute and Columbia University, where he worked on Dr. Pamela Smith's Making and Knowing Project, exploring the relationships between, between today's scientific labs and the past craft workshops. He's currently writing a book on chemical life in early modern Europe and works on a number of digital projects, including the chemistry of Isaac Newton. So Joel, can you tell us about the collecting of the history of medicine at the Huntington and how you see your role in this new position? Be happy to. <laughs> uh, so thanks so much, Claudia and Aaron, for putting this together and to everyone for attending. Um, I'm very excited to chat with you about the history of medicine collections at the Huntington, a bit how they came to be, how I approach collecting today and how it fits into the grand scheme of things at the library and in the larger world of collecting. So in general, I see my role in collecting here as standing on the sh shoulders of giants to build collections <clears throat> that will serve researchers and educate the public through exhibitions um, and other outreach. Um, this first image you see here, um, this comes from a collection that was um, originally purchased by none other than Henry E. Huntington, our founder. Um, so he is the, the most important giant upon whose shoulders that um, I stand. <clears throat> um, the history of medicine and early science has had an important presence at the Huntington um, since Mr. Huntington's time when he made several very large acquisitions. And in short, he bought so many incunabula uh, pre-1501 books that he amassed one of the largest collections of medical incunab incunables uh, in the country. Um, already in the 1930s, there were over 530 of them. So the item that you see here is one of my favorites. This is the only extant copy of this printed almanac and bleeding calendar. Um, and we have quite a few other items that are unique or just one or, or two or three copies worldwide. And for this reason, we've made it a priority to digitize parts of our collection to reach a larger public. So you can find this and many other items at um, the Huntington Digital Library, hdl.huntington.org. Um, and the next image, um, as a historian of medicine, I get goosebumps anytime I look at this item. This is a pen drawing that came to the Huntington with a first edition book of the 1543 Fabrica by Andreas Vesalius. <clears throat> and scholars have argued that it's likely the original pen drawing that uh, the frontispiece to the Fabrica was based upon by Vesalius's collaborator, the artist Jan Stefan von Kalkar. This came to the Huntington in 1959 from the collection of Edward and Julia Bodman. Um, and in addition to the incunables I mentioned, it was books like these that helped lay the foundation for our acquisition in the 1990s of the rare collections of the LA County Medical Association. Um, which is a collection from LA County that was built by major collectors. Um, so medical libraries today are really imperiled because of shifting institutional priorities. And it really creates uh, an opportunity for us because um, these special collections are really our bread and butter and right within um, our, our mission. So the next item is from a private collection that we took on just several years ago um, from a, a collector, Larry Longo, who was a physician and an OBGYN doctor and the collector probably the, of, the, of the best collection of uh, materials related to obstetrics and gynecology um, in the US at least. So this image from a 1513 copy of a book by Eucarius Roslin, uh, this is the first image of a birthing stool. And one of the most, um, the Longo collection has become one of the most used collections here in the history of medicine. And for me, it's really exciting to see how the collection is used in new ways um, to address questions about medical humanities and gender and women's studies. So this final image um, is from uh, it's the most recently acquired collection and one that I was lucky to get and keep together. So this is from the papers of Edward Anthony Spitzka, a well-known neurologist and anatomist and professor at Jefferson University in Philadelphia, who, who got significant renown as a medical student at Columbia when he did the post-mortem anatomy of presidential assassin Leon Chagolsh, who shot and killed President McKinley in 1901. So 
both Spitzka uh, and his father, uh, E.C. Spitzka, were really in the avant-garde of scientists and physicians who believed that understanding the anatomical structure of the brain would be key to understanding human behavior. So Spitzka performed postmortems of dozens of convicted murderers who were executed, um, seeking to understand what it was in the human brain that caused people to commit such acts. So this, that what you see here is um, from the postmortem of uh, George Train, um, who was actually a really notable individual. Um, Spitzka was interested in his brain because he was uh, thought to be a, a, a genius. Um, so just I'll, I'll finish by talking about how we got to get this collection. We bought the majority of it from Michael Brown, bookseller in Philadelphia. And while we were purchasing it, we found that uh, about a, another quarter of the collection really was being sold on eBay. And after some negotiation, um, this totally different seller agreed to sell us what he uh, had up for sale. And we were very happy to reunite it all together. So um, I really like the Spitzka collection as neuroscience is among my collecting priorities. Um, but also, it has extraordinary overlap with other collections of the Huntington, namely American social history, criminal justice, and American politics. So, thank you so much. Thank you, um, Joel. And we're going to just move from the mind to the heart. Erin, take it away and introduce Nancy. I am very happy to introduce Nancy Rosen, our next panelist. For more than 40 years, Nancy Rosen has been passionately following her heart and collecting the ephemera of love, friendship, and devotion. Encouraged by her late husband to make it the best in the world, the result is the formidable body of material that now resides at the Huntington. The collection, which includes more than 10,000 significant items, evolved into a comprehensive documentation of the evolution of the Valentine and the tangible way that love has been celebrated for more than 500 years. Nancy has given numerous presentations before a wide variety of organizations and audiences and has written articles for magazines and participated in videos sharing her love of the material, its history, and the actual people who populate her chronicle as the creators, givers, receivers, and savers of cherished mementos. Nancy is president emerita of the Ephemera Society of America and the president of the National Valentine Collectors Association. She's also a volunteer cataloger in the Department of Drawings and Prints at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and a member of the American Antiquarian Society and the Grolier Club. So Nancy, collecting has been a big part of your life. Can you share with us a little bit about your collecting journey? I would love to. Thank you, Erin and Claudia, uh, for this invitation. I'm honored and really delighted to be with you. I am the passionate collector among you all so um, I'm, I'm just enjoying this. My collecting journey really began when I would go uh, antiquing with my husband into antique shops in uh, New Hope, Pennsylvania, where I found a cache of Victorian die cut scraps. And I thought, gee, they would be wonderful for a project, a decoupage project one day. And then I discovered that they were decorations on Victorian Valentines. And then I wanted to get more involved and I did more reading and research. And, the earlier historic Valentines, I began to realize that love was celebrated at every stage, love and marriage, birth and death. And my focus came to embrace everything, devotion, friendship, and love. And so the tentacles of love spread out into what is the collection today. Um, I, I believe that this is the most important, the most intimate connection between people. And for more than 500 years, they've expressed intangible emotions and created tangible relics that we can enjoy. Uh, the many techniques reflect actual lives in every strata of society, um, naive handmade and later machine made throughout every era, uh, wars and crises and everything in history. Through the cherished fingerprints of love, the collection became an almost magical social documentary. Each item has a story and uh, that's part of the love of collecting. And that's what I try to tell people to share because the people you meet and the adventures and uh, uh, encouragement from, from your fellow collectors like in the ephemera society. I wanted to put together the different pieces of my story of my puzzle and create something special, something that would be important 
to elevate the Valentine so that it could be on a par with other, other areas of scholarly research. And, and that, so the public could see it as well as, as researchers. And having my collection at the Huntington Library is the ultimate fulfillment of my mission. Uh, it was a, a hobby, a passionate hobby created out of love, and now it can be shared. Um, I've selected a few examples. We don't have very much time, so I just want to give you a little, a little taste of some of the things in the collection. The first image you see is what we call a devotional from approximately 1700. It was cut on parchment by nuns in convents with a, a knife called a canivet. It was called that because that was the name of a knife that was used to sharpen crow quills for calligraphy. So the lace was supposed to em emulate actual tatted lace. And we see the ruffles and the hearts and the swags and a place where it could be uh, personalized. And in this case, we have St. Paul. And so this was a discovery. I, I found it under the glass in, a, in an antique shop on the desk. And I asked if they had any Valentine's and the man said no, but I'd done my research and I knew that it was something I had to have. And so I acquired it for, I think, $5. So that was one of my first treasures. This is another wonderful hand-painted Valentine. It looks like American folk art, but uh, it's English and it has a very rare postal cancellation on the back from Ilfracombe, England from 1806. And we see the man and woman toasting each other with a glass and here there, the sailor has returned, as he says, he, he served his, his king in war, and now he's come home to serve his wife in peace. And we have all the embellishments of love and romance. We have the arrow and quiver, the arrow and bow in the corner and quiver over here. Um, we've got the primrose and the nesting birds and the doves. And so this is an incredible statement of love. We'll go to the next one. A famous woman in all of our Valentines at the Huntington is Elizabeth Cobalt. She was famed, famous for being an 18th century romantic abolitionist poet, but she also was an incredible paper cutter. And she made these paper cuts or Sharon Schnitt. And she made them to be, certain, to be used as favors at a ball that she would have every Valentine's Day. It was called the Cliff Ball. She would fold these up in tissue paper, put them in a basket, and they would be they would be drawn as in a lottery to decide who was going to be your partner for the evening. So it was a very popular time. Elizabeth Cobalt was rare at that time because women, few women had very much education and she was knowledgeable in poetry and science and foreign languages and mythology and flowers. And she made paper cuts having to do with all of these delicate, uh, this is fairy queen of, of pleasure, lovable. Next one. And this is another famous woman in Valentine history. And this is attributed to Esther Howland. She's the mother of the American Valentine. And this is English lace paper because by, the, by this time, by say 1850, um, they were making incredible lace paper out of rag paper in England. It was imported to America. And Esther Howland, who graduated from Mount Holyoke Female Seminary in 1847, received a valentine, her father rather, who was a stationer, received a valentine. And when she saw it, she thought she could improve on them. So she set to create valentines, uh, coerced her brother to take them on a sales trip. And he came back with $5,000 worth of orders in 1848. So a huge business was begun. And this one, I'm happy to say, was in the exhibition. I'm very proud of that. Uh, there are no words on the outside because she didn't believe that you should so supposedly like wear your heart on your sleeve. The messages were all inside. And this has multiple layers. And the image, the flowers on the outside are little die cut paper uh, that was, they were hand painted. They were the beginnings of the, of the Victorian scraps. Let's go to the next one. And this is a combination of devotion, friendship, love, and and a memorial. And this is a friendship album created as a, as a departure album for a young woman, Harriet Davis, who was leaving uh, Upper New York State to go to Canada to work as a teacher. And of course, her friends and family thought they would never see her again. It wasn't far by today's standards, but at that time, it was worlds away. And here we have this weeping willow, which we, we frequently see it on other memorials, but here it's in this book. 
uh, its uh, sent, you know, as friendship, devotion, and uh, I love it. You can imagine when I opened up this this little lady's album, one page after the next, and then I came across this, which was just exquisite treasure. So there are wonderful engravings also by by Bartolazzi and Cruikshank in the in the collection, as well as Civil War cards, uh, Victorian open outs with honeycomb tissue, all the things you would imagine Valentines to be, and postcards and vinegar Valentines. It's a vast array of love, devotion, and friendship, and I couldn't be happier than to have it at the Huntington Library. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. And we couldn't be happier um, than to have it here um, with us and to have you joining us tonight. Um, and um, I, I think we're gonna be seeing quite an emphasis in Todd's presentation on um, everyday items that are often overlooked. So Aaron, would you introduce Todd? Yeah, um, last but certainly not least is Todd LaRue. Todd is Director of Special Projects for the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, producing exhibitions and public programs in support of the LA Public Library. We note that the Huntington is pleased to be collaborating with, with the LFLA and Todd in a future series, Archive Alive, which will activate the Huntington's and LAPL's complementary collections focused on Los Angeles's places and people. Todd curated the recent exhibition, 21 Collections, Every Object Has a Story, which highlighted the role of the public library as a collector of stories from the communities it serves. He's the author of Specific Museums of Greater Los Angeles, producer of At Museum A Day on Instagram, featuring 178 small museums in the LA area, and organizer of the first ever Mobile Museum Fair, which brought 30 itinerant cultural and collecting institutions together for a day-long festival. He holds an MFA in experimental sound composition from the California Institute of the Arts and is a volunteer fire lookout at Keller Peak in the San Bernardino National Forest. So Todd, you visited some 600 private and institutional collections to curate 21 collections. Can you tell us about the exhibition and some of the selections you made? Um, that's right. Thank you so much, Erin, and to Claudia as well for collecting us all here this afternoon. It's a wonderful program. So the Library Foundation, as you mentioned, we're the private nonprofit that supports the LA City Public Library System at our downtown iconic central library and 72 neighborhood branch libraries across the city. And we do a bunch of cultural programming. Uh, we produce books, exhibitions, and public programs to highlight and celebrate collections and resources that we have at the LA Public Library. And as a major large uh, public library such as LAPL, it's not just popular circulating collections, there are special collections as well, with an emphasis on those that tell the stories of the communities that we serve and on providing free and open access to all Angelinos and absolutely anybody who wants to come in. This material quite literally belongs to the people of the city. So we cast a pretty wide net for the 21 Collections exhibition. Uh, we wanted to highlight the role of the library, but also to look outside of our walls and look at what stories are being collected across Southern California. So the first one that I'll highlight actually is the only collection from the library that we highlighted in this exhibition. So if you can go to the next slide. This is our uh, collection of bullfighting materials. And uh, this came to us in the 1980s from a private collector. Uh, looks like we jumped ahead here. The bullfighting collection at the at Central Library is the second largest of its kind in North America, perhaps in the world. And we haven't really exhibited previously. We haven't known what to do with it because it's kind of a controversial subject. It's not a legal activity in the United States. But again, we're really interested in looking at the ties this might have to our local community. And so we do know, uh, going back to the era that Miro, Miroslava mentioned of Mexican California, that bullfighting was happening. Um, even after California statehood in 1850, there, the, what's now North Hill Street in Chinatown, one of our early maps of LA shows was originally or previously referred to as Calle del Toro, Bull Street. That's where the bull fights that were, took place that were reported in the Los Angeles Star, our city's first newspaper. Um, but we also found in the collection these frame posters you see on the wall advertising bullfights that took place uh, in the 20th century 
at places like the Long Beach Arena, the Orange County Fairgrounds. And at first thought, we were like, why, how could this be possible? This isn't legal. These are pretty high profile venues. I don't think this was you know, going on under the table. And it turns out that or we found through uh, looking into this further and, and talking to some of the uh, aficionados who are, uh, still have ties to the library that in fact, there's a, a version of it that's bloodless. It's Portuguese style where uh, there's no stabbing of the bull. There's actually a Velcro patch attached to its back and it's uh, more, more like a game of tag where they're trying to pin it in that manner. And this is still taking place to this day. I was most surprised to find out. There's a small community center uh, for the Portuguese community in Artesia in the Southeast corner of LA County that still hosts a bullfight every year. So in the display case, uh, I included the recent, the, the most recent addition to this collection, which was my ticket from the 2018 bullfight there. So again, looking out to, uh, you know, beyond the scope of the public library and the types of materials that we're able to house and care for. In the next slide um, is an example, a collection of envelope linings, which are from William Davies King, a professor of theater at UC Santa Barbara. And he's also the author of a memoir called Collections of Nothing. And by nothing, he refers to objects that don't have any traditional market value. In this case, the inside pattern of a regular security envelope, um, something that we see regularly, many of us handle them on a daily basis. And it's literally meant not to be looked at. It exists in order to hide the contents of the, the letter that we've received. So when you take a closer look, as in the next image, when he flips these around and cuts out a perfect square and uh, puts them in neatly in the scrapbook in a grid, it looks more like modern art than this utilitarian uh, thing that we know, you know, uh, not for its beauty, but for uh, the way we, we use it most commonly. And it makes you think perhaps about the artist, the person that designed all of these patterns, what special training they might have. Um, and so, by flipping around something, as Claudia alluded, you know, that we don't associate as having value, we can start to think about uh, how we move through the world and, and what around us has value and, and can be of interest. So another collection uh, kind of on that train of thought in the next slide is one that we are very happy to borrow from the Getty Research Institute, paper airplanes, which were collected by Harry Smith a really remarkable kind of polymath uh, artist, collector, filmmaker, anthropologist. And it was with this last hat of his as an anthropologist that he gathered a range of collections, including paper airplanes, which he found on the streets of New York from the 1960s through the 80s. And uh, would, if he saw one, he would stop traffic and run into the street to pick it up. And not only that, he would then label it with the date and intersection of where each one was found. So. It's this real archive with metadata, as an archivist would, would, would know it. And uh, it, yet he never really uh, finished this project to the extent that we know what it was he was looking for. Um, he was apparently very interested in the ways they were folded, the kind of engineering of the paper airplanes themselves. And uh, in the next slide, I think uh, many of us today would consider them more interesting for the types of ephemera that was used as a cultural artifacts. There are psychedelic concert flyers, there are political protest banners, there are menus from famous clubs like Max's Kansas City. Um, but although we don't really know what he meant to preserve or, or teach us in, in pulling this collection together, he said something uh, that I thought was really interesting and really important in thinking about the potential of collections and that was that he was leaving it to the future to, to, to determine the value of his collections, but that he knew it was a valid form of research. And so that idea of leaving it to the future is something that all archivists really have to grapple with. We're all trying to understand and, and predict what will have value and what will be seen as of interest uh, historically, sociopolitically, and in a number of other ways in the future. And it can be a uh, uh, frustrating task. Uh, it, it, it can be very surprising often looking back at what it is that we can glean meaning from. So finally, I'll just mention um, a, a collection that wasn't found, but rather created by Compton-based artist Karen Collins. 
Um, she's an amazing woman. It's an incredible story. And in the early 1990s, she'd been teaching elementary school when her oldest son, a week before high school graduation, was sentenced to prison for gang activities. And she became very depressed and was unable to keep her, her job and had, had just kept asking herself if there was not something she could have done to share more of the stories and the struggles of their community to her children. So that was the project that she took on and melded her existing interest in dioramas and miniatures and started creating these shadow box dioramas to share scenes from African-American history that she felt were very important. So the one that we uh, are, are highlighting here is one of her most recent pieces focusing on the protests around the Black Lives Matter movement and police violence that's been uh, so vocally uh, opposed in our communities in recent years. And what it's so striking to me, um, you know, protests like Black Lives Matter, things like the Women's March are becoming uh, really kind of hot button uh, events, very historically important things that today's archivists are acknowledging we'll want to know more about in the future. Um, but the kinds of original ephemera, the protest signs that many types of institutions are collecting, lack a kind of immediacy that I think is conveyed through the, these scenes and the dioramas that Karen creates. So it's, a, it's a, a collection born of the community and is a really beautiful way of preserving their stories. So with that, I know we wanna have some time for discussion. So I'll conclude and thank you so much again for including our exhibition in the, in the panel. Thank you so much, Todd, um, for um, a rather dramatic and moving end, um, the case of creating a collection to tell a story that you feel is not being heard. Um, we have some relevant resources here um, for people to consult, um, to know more about some of the topics and organizations that have been discussed. And now let's, um, we're a bit over, uh, over our time for this. Everyone had so much to share. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. And now we're all here together and can talk a bit about some of the common themes. I think one of the biggest themes was um, Saving history, rescuing, the rescue operation, Brad and the dumpster. And um, maybe some of you have things to say to each other about that, um, about the rescue operation. I think it's really striking Miroslava's collection that she really knew it belonged in a repository, but only because she was an historian. And so there are many people, I'm sure that, you know, Lee Wei can speak to this and in his interactions with people. There are many people who don't really know that the material they have has, has value. Some people are muted. Could, could I say, just to start, I also had a, a great question to ask, like how difficult is it or what kinds of challenges are there in donating family papers? And luckily Clay Stahls there at the Huntington was so wonderful in facilitating um, you know, the actual donating to the archive is one thing. And it's also then, I think the challenge, and this is probably 99% of the challenge is getting family to let go of that material. You know, one is identifying whether they have it, but also then saying, okay, I'm willing to share it or to give it up because that was my fear. My family would say no. Uh, but I know that in past when I've shared stories with other family members or communities that of, of this work, of the fact that this collection was made a collection at the Huntington, they'll tell me, oh, I have letters, we have letters or so forth. And then when I go back to them, they'll say, oh, I can't find them or hmm, I don't know where they, you know, all of a sudden they become lost. So there's a lot of trepidation in, in letting those um, items go. Um, and so it's a fine balance of knowing how much to push people or how much to ask them to share the material. So that is definitely a challenge. Um, I think for me, it's a very common thing that I come across is that a lot of donors feel they're always surprised that I'm that that 
I as a curator or, or the Huntington is even interested in their family materials. They're always saying things like, you know, it's all, you know, our history is not important or nobody cares. Um, but, you know, they're always surprised that we're interested in. It. And so even though they don't think it's interesting, uh, but somehow they saved it, you know, whether it's, you know, passing it down generations or just putting it in their garage. Uh, that's a very common thing that I come across. And so, you know, even though they don't think it's important, but then, you know, I think deep down, they feel like this is not something that they can just throw away. And so, so, you know, at, at some point, you know, they were, you know, whether they're retiring or they're moving and they were, you know, sort of forced, you know, to do something about the collections. And so that's where we come in, uh, you know, if it's a good fit with us, you know, I, I think there's a lot of potential for collections to come to the Huntington, you know, uh, get its preservation treatments and, and that we allow, uh, you know, uh, we make the collection publicly available to scholars and to, to, to everyone in the community so that they can research the collection and know about this history. So it's, it's a lot of developing trust and, and bringing an awareness to what can happen when papers are put in a library. Um, another theme that I heard throughout was emphasis on um, everyday people. And um, certainly Nancy, your, your collection, you spoke about that very beautiful, beautifully, but that also hooks up with something um, like Joel's collection. So the, um, the experiences of women and not that a child childbirth is in a sense, everyday experience, you know, it's the beginning of life. Um, it, it's, uh, it, and, and these kinds of experiences that maybe were not looked at the same way that they are today. Some of the things that I collect, um, the, the folk art types of things, some of them were made by children and you wouldn't think that people would save them, but they were saved. And now we have a whole new respect for all of these things that were made for teachers or the things that are made from woven paper, little hearts and things cut out from fabric. So we kind of appreciate the past much more now, but some of it was not meant to be saved. We talk about ephemera, you know, things that were discarded, you know, but these, these were cherished and thankfully so. Um, but uh, there are people collecting all different aspects, whether it's the folk art or the fine art, but there it's across, my collection covers everything from engravings and, and original art and uh, all kinds of things that people just represent love. Um, in, in the history of medicine, in recent years, there's been a big shift to uh, look at things from the patient's perspective um, and not simply from the perspective of um, physicians or learned individuals. And um, I think what's really interesting to me is how a lot of the materials that were collected, you know, originally from um, the doctor's perspective are now being mined for, for other information about, say, um, the, the patient's perspective. Yeah. yeah. And, and Brad, wh what you're, you're selling a lot of ephemera. Yeah, something, something uh, Lee Wei said really um, st uh, stuck with me. Um, Actually, the first major archive we placed there at the Huntington, um, this must have been 10, 12 years ago, um, it was uh, an estate situation where, you know, they brought us in to look at uh, a bunch of architecture books, which really weren't wa were worthwhile. Um, and of course, as we do, we are scurrying about uh, looking at all the paper we can. And uh, in the basement garage, um, off in the corner, there were all these uh, boxes of paper, which were stacked up with the rest of the garbage to go out uh, before the estate sale. And uh, Jennifer and I started digging through it. And it was the extant papers of a German Luftwaffe scientist um, who had been brought over to the United States as part of Operation Paperclip. And uh, he had passed away in a car accident very shortly after he uh, was brought over in the late 40s. And so the family that was still around had really no connection to him personally or very little. Um, and this material didn't mean anything to them, um, but they were these incredible scientific reports on the testing of materials under stress, um, photographic reports, uh, just copious details, a really, really fantastic repository of information and uh, uh, very close to being lost forever. 
Um, and um, uh, we see a lot of that. And uh, you also talked about the commonplace, which has taken on new importance. Recently, we found um, in a, a collection uh, of a history professor, he had retained a school report from the early 1960s and a young woman uh, had written about her family's experience being interned at uh, the, the uh, relocation camp in Colorado. Um, and interspersed in the report were like the, the handbook that they gave every Japanese American that came, copies of the, the newspaper that they produced there in the camp, and even a few photographs. And, you know, 1960 to have this awareness that uh, what a grave injustice was done to the Japanese American community you know, and it's a school report. It was, you know, a middle school report. And um, uh, it's just a fantastic survivor, which provides excellent commentary and con uh, context to the new scholarship on, on what's a really important aspect of our past. Other thoughts, Todd, you went and visited 600 collections. It was can a- you tell, Can you tell us a little what that was like and you know, we've got Nancy here as a private collector and they are a passionate and and perhaps eccentric group. Can you tell us about some of the uh, really passionate yeah. people you met? Well, you're being generous perhaps. Um, I mean, we've gone through an entire program about collecting now without using the word obsessive. Um, <laughs> that's definitely a quality that I tapped in my research. You know, it, it wouldn't have been possible to visit that many locations without spending weekends and, and any free time that I had researching, let alone visiting these places. Uh, the overall experience, I have to say, it's an amazing way to see the city that we call home. The, the breadth of diversity um, and the, you know, while on the one hand, there are so many stories of people whose, whose lifelong collections uh, don't have a clear path for protection, um, for preservation, uh, the fact that there are so many people taking the burden on to save and preserve the stories that are important to them, whether or not they have institutional recognition for their efforts, I found extremely expiring. And you talk about um, the idea of collecting as, as saving, you know, it is a race against time uh, for all of these materials. And um, even those that have found their way to institutions, you know, there was a survey a few months ago of a, fully a third of museums in the country are unsure they can survive the pandemic. I saw a preliminary report this morning from the California State Library that uh, some uh, similarly a large alarming percentage of collecting institutions in the state do not have long term preservation plans. Um, you know, so many institutions are, are doing the best they can against really uh, challenging odds, and I definitely commend everybody here, and especially the Huntington who's collected us together today, for your efforts, because it's not a small thing. It doesn't go without saying that the important stories of our, uh, you know, of our society are going to be saved to be able to be referenced uh, by future generations. Yeah, I mean, to, to put it quite, quite simply, I like to say to people, stuff is a burden. It's a burden. And um, uh, what survives can often uh, have a lot of chance to it. But those of us who are in cultural institutions that collect, we really do take it very seriously about trying to have a balanced and representative point of view of history, of leaving uh, um, a diverse group of narratives. Erin, um, should we go to some of the questions? We have a little bit of time. We're, we're probably just about over, really. But I have one from somebody I know, for Nancy, which is, is it possible to ask Nancy Rosen if she ever visited Brandon's memorabilia in New York City? Yes, I, I remember that very well. It was a long time ago. <laughs> Once, did you get any good Valentines there? I think it was in the beginning of my collecting era. I don't, I don't remember what I got there, but I do remember the shop. Yeah, I have to find out who wrote that question, if they remember it. Yeah, and, 
I mean, play, the stuff and the places you find it um, and the collections. We're also being asked, Todd, are you familiar with Moore York Gallery in Highland Park? It's an amazingly fortuitous question because Moore York, uh, the, the gallery and studio of Claire Graham was one of our featured collections in this exhibition. I wish I'd been able to share about all of them, um, but this, uh, it, it's, it, it's right on York and 50th, I believe. And it's a, a warehouse with no sign or windows out front, but when you step in, you've entered a magical wonderland. And Claire um, is, is an amazingly generous person who what we were able to feature is some furniture that he crafted, uh, a, a beautiful bench made from many thousands of soda tabs and another beautiful bench made from uh, many hundreds of yardsticks that he very expertly uh, assembled into usable furniture, which actually was our usable uh, gallery furniture for this exhibition. So uh, his doors occasionally open in normal times during art walks and things. Um, so I definitely encourage anyone to stroll in there for an incredible experience. Todd, is there a listing of the 600 places you visited in on the website or anywhere else? The best thing for that would be the Instagram account that you mentioned in the introduction, which is museum a day, all one word on Instagram. It's over now, but during the run of the exhibition, I was posting uh, one small and unique mm collecting cultural institution from the LA area every single day the exhibition was on view. And so I know Claire was, folk, uh, was, was highlighted one of those days and um, that, that should be enough, 178 of them to keep you busy for a while. Well, we're actually over time and um, maybe we're gonna just add uh, one more question to be answered. And I think it's kind of a significant one. Libraries are encouraging the collecting of materials while at the same time getting rid of all sorts of important holdings. Um, so this is a really controversial area, um, what institutions are retaining. And does anyone wanna to speak to that? Brad's in the trade. And of course, uh, some of this comes through um, into the trade. Um, uh, it is controversial. Um, we hold on to our special collections here at the Huntington. Um, so we're not in that position. Uh, I think a lot of places have had problems um, with their operating budgets and holding on to things. And, and it is a burden as Todd was saying. Does anyone else wanna address that issue? Joel? Um, there's a, a difficult line to draw between collecting and hoarding. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the sad thing is we, we just have limited resources and there's only so much that we can, um, you know, take, take in and, and take care of. And those items that we do take in, we commit to. Um, so I, I can't speak for, you know, other institutions, but um, I, I it, they're, they're just really difficult um, questions that we have to ask. And I think in recent years, we've, we've become especially careful about what we do take in because we recognize it's such an important commitment that we make to these materials. Mm -hmm. I would also and say, that, because he mentions libraries, um, I think this may have been a problem uh, more in the past than it is in recent years. I know that in the library world, uh, there's more recently become a set of standards for deaccessioning. Uh, you have to sort of check off all the boxes to make sure that it's not unique. You know, when our library is weeding, which, which is what we call, you know, thinning the shelves, it's the only thing they're getting rid of is extra copies of popular materials or things that have been destroyed. Um, none of the special collections ever leave and it would be a big deal if they did. Um, occasionally you see a news story of this happening and it's, it is controversial for the reasons you suggest. People don't want to see this history destroyed. Um, you know, museums have this problem as well. They might have to save a painting to save their endowment. Um, so it, it's always big news and nobody likes doing it. But fortunately, there's become more of a standardized agreements for what's, what's acceptable to get rid of moving forward. Yeah, so um, I think that's a 
good place to end because it brings us back to the beginning, which is that we're all needed. Different institutions, private collectors, the trade, we're all needed to preserve this material. So the stories of the past can be available to the future. And I wanna thank everyone who took the time to join us this evening and um, to wish you and those close to you well in this difficult period. And um, we hope to see you again at a future event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you to Ben Tuttle, our audiovisual man, to all the participants. <laughs>